Today's episode is sponsored by Podacy. Podacy is an online community where you can discover and discuss top podcast recommendations with fellow listeners like yourself. This means that you can spend less time searching for a podcast that fits your interests and more time listening to new binge-worthy podcasts. Whether you enjoy true crime, mysteries, or storytelling, you'll find great podcasts recommended by Podacy's community of podcast superfans. Receive podcast recommendations tailored to your interests and tastes and based off the people you follow, so you never miss a great podcast again. Every Sunday, you get a newsletter roundup of the best podcast recommendations, playlists, and more in your inbox. Discover true crime and trending podcasts you wouldn't find otherwise access the top charts to view the top episodes being listened to across the app and connect with fellow podcast fans to discuss podcasts you love like ours podacy has been described by listeners as revitalizing the podcast world and a delightful app share your favorite podcasts with podcast playlists similar to music playlists but for podcasts Podacy is available on any browser at podacy.fm, or you can unlock more features by downloading the iOS or Android app. Recommend your favorite episodes of our podcast on Podacy so more podcast fans can learn about it. Podacy is Odyssey spelled with a P, P O D Y S S E Y. Follow us on Podacy to connect with us. Visit podacy.fm or the link in the show notes to check it out. The Oracle Network. Hello and welcome to Yield Crime, where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I am your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stengel. Hello. Hi. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. When, we rec- <laughs> when you read or hear this, read it. Oh, God. As you can tell, again, we've switched up our time. Mm-hmm. So this is another loopy Sunday night, which is not typical for us. Yep. Because I was super late getting my notes done. Doop, doop, doop. It's okay. But it's Halloween here. Even though you'll, by the time you'll be hearing this, it'll be coming up to turkey time. Uh, it'll be the third yeah. of November. I feel like the whole <laughs> month of Thanksgiving, though, you know, it's like the whole, everybody's like, fall, leaves, turkey, like just lots of turkeys. And then there's only one actual day that involves turkeys that whole month. But yeah. You know, you know what I mean? Like, as soon mm-hmm. as it's November 1st, it's like turkey, like paraphernalia everywhere. Only in cross. some places because it's just Christmas everywhere and that makes me angry. Not that I think Thanksgiving is something to be like, woo, yeah, <laughs> about there's only so much turkey shit you can put around your house. Yeah. I said, as someone who doesn't decorate her house at all, really, I don't for any either. holidays. We're actually, so my partner doesn't celebrate Christmas, but he celebrates solstice for like the Viking solstice tradition. Mm -hmm. So I get to figure out what that is. (laughs) Like I'm I'm very intrigued and I know it involves a tree, but it also involves a fire outside. I was Mm -hmm. like, where are we going to do this fire? Because we live within the city limits, (laughs) which you can do, but that's sometime soon because the solstice is in November, isn't it? I don't remember. Maybe it's December. Don't it's ask me soon. to think about things right now. I know. I can't, I can't even like come to terms that it's Halloween versus all of the other holidays. All right. So blanket disclaimer. Uh-oh. We are going to Spain. Spain. So there will be a lot of Spanish. I am doing my best. I do not have a Spanish accent. And Spain Spanish is very different from the type of Spanish that we know in the United States. I'm going to do my best. But I apologize to everybody who speaks Spanish and everyone <laughs> in Spain. So It's going to be Spain without the S. Yeah. I'm just going to bring the pain. Pain. <laughs> All right. We are no longer in Spooktember. So we are back to our regularly oh. scheduled programming of crimes and all things that are bad. <laughs> Today we are going to be talking about Juan Diaz de Carreo Ruiz de Argandona. Ooh, that's a 
beautiful name. Yeah, he's not a beautiful person. Oh, no. (laughs) That's usually how it happens. So information was pulled from the following sources, and these were the only ones that I could find in English. I'm sure there was a lot more in Spanish. Right. But the 2021 Digis Mac article by Ava Garcia, Sanz de Uturi, nailed it. 2016 (laughs) Neurosciences and History article by S. Jimenez Rodan. An 1881 book, El Sacamentacas, His Portrait and His Crimes. Written narration yeah. according to all authentic Uturi data by Ricardo Vicero de Bengoa. Fun fact. That was all in Spanish, the actual book, but it was the source of truth for a lot of the sources that I looked at. So mm-hmm. I'm including it because otherwise I would have like no sources. Also a Google Arts and Culture article, three different Wikipedia links, and nice. a WikiTree article. Okay, so neuroscience. I grabbed that. Mm-hmm. He's a really bad man, isn't he? Yeah, he's not great. Oh, no. And links to all of these articles will be included in the show notes. Oh, boy. Okay, now i got to say his whole name again. Let's scroll back up. <laughs> Juan Diaz de Guerrero Ruiz de Argandona was born on October 17th, 1821, to parents Nicolas Diaz de Guerrero Lopez de Zuazo, and Norberta Ruiz de, why didn't I translate, de Argandona Elguea in Spain. Nice. He was one of nine children, and two of his siblings, Juana and Francisco, died in infancy. Mm, typical of that era. Yeah. Era. Juan was also the youngest. I was just going to ask, where is he in this birth? But the, the youngest are all... The most sinister, I would know. Yes. I am. I am the youngest. So was he. Burn it down. His parents were farmers in Aguilas, which is a village near Salvatierra, which has a population of less than 5,000. So think very rural. Is this kind of in the center of Spain or is it by a coast? Because I know Spain is pretty small. From what I looked at, it looks like it's kind of... Like mainland? Very mainland, but like towards the southwest. Like it's not right by a border, but it's kind of in that little lower pocket of Spain. Okay. So that would make sense that it was rural. and I could be wrong. If you're Spanish and you want to tell me that I'm wrong, go ahead. Because (laughs) I'm here for it. Right. (laughs) The correction cubby is wide open. It's so open. (laughs) If my stuttering Spanish is anything to go by. You got it. There are reports that both of them were heavy drinkers and that Nicholas had a habit of beating his children when he was intoxicated. Great. Awesome. Juan never received an education and unsurprisingly was illiterate, but he was hardworking and had a very serious personality. Very stern. That'll get him out, hopefully. No, that's his dad. No, Juan. That is Juan. Yes. Yes. Personality will get him out of there. Mm -hmm. In 1835, when he was 14, his parents sent him to work as a farmhand, shepherd, and coal miner during the first Carlist War. Dang. Not all at the same time, but like... okay. I was like, that's hard for anybody, little 14-year-old that can't read. So I looked this up because obviously in the U.S. we learned very little about the history of the rest of the world. (laughs) What? Unless it has to do with something that we did. So the first Carlist War took place between 1833 and 1840 and was the first of three civil wars fought in Spain. The war started because the people of Spain were fighting over the succession of the Spanish throne. Those who identified as Carlists were in support of Carlos V, who was the brother of the late king. Okay. Liberals were in favor of the regent, Maria Cristina, who was ruling in place of Isabella II until she became of age. Ooh. This is considered by many historians to be the largest and deadliest civil war of that time period. Yeah. Even like if you just think of people who wanted a man to lead versus a woman mm-hmm. leading, there's a lot of strong, strong emotion there. Yep. So... Politics aside, just looking at the sex of the leaders, you can 
tell that it wouldn't be good. Yep. So were they, they were Carl? Carlos. Carl, Carlos people? Well, so basically Juan was sent out to help neighboring farmers while the men who were of age were off fighting, fighting. in this war. Because he wasn't of age. Okay. Yeah. So he didn't have to fight yet. That's good. You never know, because back then, of age could have been like 12. (laughs) Yeah, this is true. (laughs) So he helped in the neighboring towns of Salvatierra, Aliza, Ocariz, Izarta, Anua, and Alegria Dulanchi. That's a lot. He really really went around. Yeah. Well, I mean, he had three different jobs in a bunch of different towns. Yeah. They were like, we don't need you anymore. Go over here. Go help the miners. And he's like, what? Okay. (laughs) Okay. In 1850, at the age of 29, he was working as a servant for a widow named Antonia Berostaguieta, who was in need of someone with farming and field management experience. Which he had. He did. The pair soon got married on November 25th, 1850. Yep. Antonia was 26 at the time of their marriage. And mm-hmm. He was 29, so it wasn't that much of an age gap. No, but I could see how if he has a big personality and he knows how to run her household and she's a widower, how that would have been kind of bing, bam, boom. Hmm. Ideal situation for him. That's true. Three years into their marriage, they started having children, of which they would have five. Nice. Candido in 1853. Josefa in 1856, Thomas in 1859, Eduardo in 1861, and Teodora in 1863. Very impressive how mm-hmm. they were able to keep that, you know, in counts of three and two. Mm-hmm. Dang. Their last two, Eduardo and Teodora, died in infancy. Oh. And it looks like Antonia died shortly after the birth of Teodora most likely from complications after her birth. And she passed on November 27th, 1863, at the age of 39. Oh, that's so young. Eduardo passed a little over a year after his birth, and Teodora passed at nine months old. Mm. Juan and Antonia's marriage, which lasted 13 years, was very happy. With three surviving children to take care of, it's probably not that surprising that Juan would get married again. Yep. He married his second wife, Juana Salazar Salazar, on February 7th, 1864, around two and a half months after Antonia's death. Dang. Juan was 43 and Juana was 30. Okay. Well, I suppose of childbearing age would have been ideal. Mm Mm-hmm. Unlike his marriage with Antonia, his marriage to Juana was not a happy one. Juana did not get along with her stepchildren, who would frequently leave the house in order to avoid her. His eldest son, Candido, left the home to serve in another household. And in 1867, Juana gave birth to a son named Cecilio, who would pass away at the age of five. And I couldn't find anywhere what he died from. So Probably... A common illness of the time. Probably. Yeah. It was around this time that Juan committed his first murder. Oh, that escalated quickly. (laughs) Yep. We're there. (laughs) Oh, man. Okay. On the afternoon of April 2nd, 1870, he hired a woman from Vitoria known as Melitona, who had turned to sex work as a means to support herself while her husband was in jail. Oh, Gosh, what a bad situation. Juan and Melitona exited the city via the Portal de Rey and headed to Navarre before stopping by the Rey Chachiqui stream to have sex. As you do when you're a sex worker. Yep. Makes sense. After doing the deed, Juan offered her three Spanish reales, which today would equate to about 141 euros. Dang. But... Melatonia stated that that wasn't enough. He offered to pay her an additional real, but she demanded five total, which would be around 235 euros. Okay. You know, I bet you she told him the rate before, and then he was like, I'm going to pay you this instead. Yeah. By now, Juan was over it, 
So he tackled her and pushed down on her throat with both hands until she fell unconscious, at which time he dragged her down to the stream and held her head underwater until she drowned. Awesome. What a horrible way to die. After this, he took off her clothes and laid her out on the ground on her back. After sitting next to her lifeless corpse for a while, he eventually covered her back up with her clothes, but he didn't redress her, and then left her there before returning to the city once the sun had set. Some stories say he abused her corpse after she was dead, but I didn't read anything to verify that claim. That was just in one source. Yeah. Either way, really messed up. Yep. Really messed up. Melitona's body was discovered the next morning by a servant that was out picking flowers on the bank of the stream. Oh, of course. Oh, God. At which time they alerted the authorities. Yeah. With nothing to go on other than the woman's body, the police could only archive the case due to lack of evidence for a proper investigation. Yeah. Juan wouldn't commit another murder until almost a full year later, on March 12, 1871. Juan encountered a poor widow named Agueda in Portal del Rey begging on the street, and he invited her to come with him towards Navarre. Mm -hmm. She told him that she hadn't eaten, so he gave her one real in order to get something to eat before telling her he'd wait for her on the road to Navarre. Okay. Agueda visited a local inn where she procured a loaf of bread and a glass of wine before she joined Juan at which point the two proceeded down the road to a place known as, oh shit, I didn't read uh, La Biscara, where they stopped to have sex. Oh, okay. That's unexpected. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Afterwards, Juan offered Agueda some money, but once again, she protested that the amount was too low. This becomes a common theme. Great. In a repeat of his last murder, he basically tackled her to the ground before he strangled her to death, leaving her body where it lay before returning to the city under the cover of darkness. Great. It's said that he also beat her about the face, but again, I couldn't be sure if that was pre- or post-mortem and if that even actually happened, because again, it only appeared in one source, and it wasn't mentioned anywhere else. It could be one of those, like, telephone kind of things that happens. When people embellish. Or it was real and just as awful. Because it just doesn't really fit his MO. But yeah, we'll get into it. It, so. it seems like with the strangling, he kind of wants a unmessy death. Yeah. So far. Yep. Regardless, the widow's body was discovered the following day. And like his first murder, the case was shelved due to lack of information. It was a few months after Juan committed the two murders that his wife, Juana, died on May 16th, 1871, from smallpox at the age of 37. Oh, I mean, if the marriage was that bad, at least it was kind of done. Yeah. Seven years is a long time. Yeah. About a year after Juana's death, Juan married once again to a woman named Agustina Ruiza de Loizaga Murga who he married on June 26, 1872. Agustina was 42, and Juan was 51 at the time of their marriage. Yeah, he likes him younger, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Not much is known about Agustina. I couldn't find out if she had any children of her own prior to marrying Juan, Mm -hmm. and there is no information anywhere about the two of them having any children together. Okay, so odds are they probably didn't, or... Or couldn't. Because, I mean, given their ages and given her age, she's kind of past prime. Baby her prime. Mom. I mean, she still could yeah. have had children, but That's, chances are yeah. she didn't. And it was actually probably for the best, considering their marriage wasn't great. Uh, most likely because Augustina was an alcoholic. Great. Awesome. Just a few months after his marriage to Augustina, Juan struck again on August 21st, 1872. Unlike his first two crimes, this murder took place at noon, and the victim wasn't a sex worker. Wow. Juan had been traveling to a nearby village when he encountered a 13-year-old servant girl no. named Antonia, who was walking towards Vitoria on an errand for her employer. Trigger warning, this next bit has to do with a sexual assault, so if you need to skip ahead about 30 seconds or so, please do so. Juan grabbed and hauled her off the road crushing her throat until she lost consciousness before he assaulted her. Oh, no. 
Afterwards, he strangled her until she died, hid her body in a ditch, and then returned to his home in Vitoria around 2 p.m. the same day. It's awful. And it's escalating, too. He's getting really confident. Yep. Her body was discovered the following day and caused a huge commotion in the village of Vitoria, as well as the neighboring towns in the area. I bet. Child died. Mm -hmm. Investigators were at a loss with zero leads and no evidence to go off of. As if that wasn't bad enough, it wasn't long before Juan struck again. Of course. So that murder took place on August 21st. Mm -hmm. At dusk on the evening of August 29th, so just eight days oh, later. Damn. Yeah, he really is escalating. Juan approached a 23-year-old woman named Maria Campos, not far from his home, that was a known sex worker, and he propositioned her. The two soon departed and headed towards La Rioja by the Portal de Barreras. Juan walked some distance behind her as they made their way to La Rioja so they wouldn't be seen together. Okay, yeah. So he's still trying to be kind of careful. Mm -hmm. The two reunited some ways down the road near a bridge where they proceeded to have sex. Mm -hmm. Upon completion, he offered Maria two reales before offering up to four, which would be about 153 euros today. And if she was known in the game, that wouldn't have been enough. Yeah. And after she continued to protest that the amount wasn't enough, mm -hmm. he subdued and strangled her until he believed she was dead. But as Ooh. he was getting ready to leave, he noticed that she began to move. Oh, no. I was really hoping. It was at this point that he held her down with his knees, took her hairpin out of her hair, and straightened it before stabbing her in the heart. Oh, my God. When he was sure that she was dead, he placed her body by the river and returned home in the evening. Upon the discovery of her body, the police investigated a soldier who was headed to Vitoria since at this time the Third Carlist War had just started. However, the man was found innocent and allowed to go free after being cleared. The panic that the murders caused was still felt in the town of Vitoria and the nearby villages, with many women refusing to travel alone, and the towns yeah, became oh virtually deserted after sunset. Yeah, I bet. I can only imagine. I wouldn't want to walk around at night. Yeah. That would be awful. The murder stopped for a year before Juan struck again in August of 1873, requesting the services of another sex worker during the afternoon on his way to the Reykachiki. Mm -hmm. He repeated the same routine, sex, followed by offering less than the desired amount of compensation, uh -huh. before he attempted to strangle her when she continued to refuse the money he offered. However, unlike his previous victims, she was able to scream, which alerted the guards at the nearby Polvarin Viero, the prison, which yeah. forced Juan to flee the scene. Hell yeah. Juan waited almost another full year before striking again in June of 1874, this time targeting a sick old woman who was begging on the road of La Zumacara. Without warning, he struck and attempted to strangle her. But like his last victim, she was able to scream and defend herself until two other women arrived to offer her assistance, causing Juan to once again leave the scene of the crime. Insane. The most frustrating thing about this crime is the fact that the victim was able to positively identify her attacker, stating that he was drunk and had attacked her out of the blue, but no one thought it was important enough to tell the police this little detail. Really? No one told the police. Because she was because she was a beggar, probably a poor old beggar. Probably, probably she was crazy or something. Yep. Or didn't care. Yep. Awful. It would be four years before Juan struck again. That's interesting. That yeah. He he waited that long. Probably because he was so close to getting caught. Freaking Maybe. Out. Maybe. During this four-year gap, his wife Augustina had passed, likely mm -hmm. as a result of her years of hard drinking. Yeah. He had come home from a hard day of work to find her bedridden and writhing in agony. After fetching the doctor, he was told there was nothing they could do for her. Augustina died on April 4th, 1877, at the age of 47. Dang. A month later, on May 7th, 1877, Juan married his fourth and final wife, Juana Sayens de Bisate Diaz de Otazu. Juana was a widow 
and she was 52 at the time they were married. Juan was 56, and it's unclear if she had any previous children. Okay. Even though his final three marriages weren't the best, Juan never made any attempt to harm his spouses. He is even cited as saying, quote, no, I did not kill her. And this is in reference to his third wife. Yeah. Because if I had, I would have declared it as I have done with the others, mm-hmm. end quote. Yeah. Well, th- it, it is strange that he doesn't, but he was consistent with all of them. Like, it's almost like he just married him to have somebody at the house. Yeah. And then just kind of did whatever he wanted. Well, and these crimes are all very sexually motivated. Yeah. So in my mind, it's something where if these marriages aren't happy and he is not getting what he wanted at home, he, he is motivated to take it all out and somebody else who mm-hmm. presumably won't be missed in his right. mind. Right. So he can take out all of his frustrations, including the murder he wants. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Juan succumbed to his murderous urges once again on November 1st, 1878, when he went to a mill just outside of Vitoria that he had been to in the past and discovered that the female miller, Angela Lopez de Armentia, was working alone. (sighs) After sharing pleasantries, he attempted to strangle her, but Angela was able to overpower him because at this point Juan was now 57, and obviously he wasn't the fittest person in the world. Yep. He fled, but Angela reported him to the police, and he was arrested and sentenced to two months jail time at the local prison. Are you kidding? Oh, because he didn't actually kill her. Yep. Yeah. 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 Assault cases tend to be very low sentences. Yep. Around a year later, on August 25th, 1879, Juan was on his way to Castile when he came upon an old beggar woman between the villages of Cominca and Arinez. He offered her alms before pushing her off the road, causing her to fall and hit her head on a rock. Juan went to jump over her body, but she kicked him in the belly and he fell down. Hell yeah. You go. She then got up and ran screaming to Vittoria. Juan followed her back to the city at a distance and then begged his wife, Juana, to help him sort things out with the woman so he wouldn't be sent back to jail. Wow. The woman agreed to keep quiet only after she was paid 80 reales, which in today's money would equate to over 2,600 euros. Nice. After this incident, Juan changed careers and took up work in the Somorostro Mines in Bisay. So he basically... He became a miner in his 60s? Yeah, he was just like, I gotta get out of here, bye. (laughs) Oh, man. That's one way to do it. Yeah. On the evening of September 7th, 1879, he ran into a woman named Maria Dolores Cortazar on his way home from work. She had once worked as a maid in Vitoria, and the two struck up a conversation. That only lasted until Juan pushed her off the road once he felt Mm -hmm. the coast was clear, at which point he took her handkerchief and tied it to her neck. He then asked her for sex and promised her money in return. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you pushed and tied down, and then he's like, will you have sex with me? I don't think you have much of a choice there, yep. regardless, unfortunately. Yep. When Maria kept resisting, he threatened her, and then stabbed her several times in the chest with a razor. What? Yep. Oh, God, ow. Trigger warning again. Hmm. Skip ahead 30 seconds if mentions of sexual assault are not okay for you. Juan then proceeded to assault Maria before fatally Mm -hmm. stabbing her in the belly. Yeah. He then hid her body and the basket of food she had been carrying before taking a detour into the mountains instead of heading home to Vitoria. Mm -hmm. It was at this time that he was seen by a farmer. Juan had stopped at a roadside inn called... Venta de Grillo, where he had a drink before he slept under a bridge near Arriaga by the Sadora River. Okay. He has a thing with bridges. Yeah. And water. Mm Mm-hmm. And have you noticed, too, that, like, he generally kills in August? Yeah. He he attacks in the summer. 
he attacks when people yeah. are, are known to be outside. Yeah. But like August especially. So I wonder if like his first wife died in August or something. I don't know. Let's see. She died in November. Oh, okay. And I was wondering if that would have been a correlation, but apparently not. Yeah. And he first committed murder. I mean, he waited a while. He waited mm-hmm. seven years before he Yeah, he waited until the unhappy murder. marriage. Yeah. Was done. When did the second wife die? Did did you know the month for that? She died. Juana died in May. Mm. Okay, there goes my theories. Yeah, it's kind of all across the board. Yeah. In the morning, he had breakfast at an inn in Ariaga, then returned to the bridge where he had slept before leaving the road and climbing the hill of Araka. Mm-hmm. He's a very spry 60-some-year-old man. Yeah. He's very... He has no problems climbing around yeah. and hiking. It reminds me of the the East Area Iran's. Iran's, yeah. Yeah, because he's in his 80s and still is super spry. Mm-hmm. Gross. As he was climbing the hill, he came upon a 52-year-old farming woman from no. Navarrete named Manuela Aguadicauna, who was heading home to Vitoria after attending a festival. Great. The two soon got to talking before taking refuge under a tree when it started to rain. Juan, in a moment of sincerity, told Manuela of his intention to murder her. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> he must have actually liked her. I don't know. Like, sorry. Um, I want to kill you. <laughs> sorry, I need to kill you. <laughs> what? At which point she tried to flee. Juan grabbed her and strangled her with her own apron. Aww. After subduing her, even though she was still breathing, he took off all of her clothes but was unable to get an erection. Good. Upon discovering this, he stabbed her in the heart and the belly with the same <sighs> razor he'd used on Maria before taking it to Jack the Ripper levels of awfulness when he proceeded to cut open her belly to take out her intestines and one of her kidneys. Jesus, man. This is, like, his escalation is insane. Yeah. It's pretty like, crazy. He just lost all sense of being a human at that point. Yeah. It's, wow. Yeah, the escalation is pretty crazy. After this, he wiped the blood off his hands with her clothes, covered her body, ate the food she'd been carrying home with her from the festival, then went back to the bridge by the Sadora River, where he again spent the night. That also kind of reminds me of, like, the axe murderer guys. Remember when he, they, like, hung out in the house and ate the food and mm-hmm. just, like, casually hung out mm-hmm. with, next to bodies? Mm-hmm. Gross. The following morning, he threw the razor into the river and cleaned himself up before finally heading back home where he changed clothes before leaving right away for the village of Alegria. The bodies of Maria and Manuela were discovered that same day. Of course. It was after this double murder that the police investigation was conducted by Judge Jose Antonio de Parada and included agents from Vitoria and the Guardia Civil, basically the Civil Guard. Mm -hmm. The commander of the Morgia unit listened to the testimony of a male employee who recalled seeing Maria in the company of a man. The same commander interviewed farmers and people who had been at the inn during the time of the murders, who all claimed to have seen a man who matched the description that the mail carrier had provided. Mm -hmm. The description of the man in question was sent to Vitoria, where Pio Fernandez de Pinedo made the connection that it was likely Juan as the description matched the one that linked Juan to the attack on the female Miller when he was first imprisoned. Okay. After hearing Mm. of another unsuccessful attack back in August of the old woman who got bought for her silence. Who was like, I'll tell you now. (laughs) Yes. Pio requested a warrant to arrest Juan. Upon arriving at Juan's home with the arrest warrant, Pio was informed by his wife, Juana, that he was not home and that she hadn't seen him since the incident with the old woman, after which he'd traveled to Bisai to work in the mines. Mm -hmm. She informed him that she didn't know where he was or why he had attacked the old woman in the first place. Meanwhile, 
Juan was working for a farmer in Alegria, where news of the double homicide reached shortly after he started working there. The farmer's young daughter commented that the new servant was, quote, so ugly, end quote, that he reminded her of the Sacamentacas, which is the Spanish name for a fat extractor or a fat seller, and is the name commonly used in reference to a boogeyman or criminal who kills for human fat. Oh, that's a really horrifying legend. Yeah. So quick tangent. Mm -hmm. The El Sacamentacas legend comes from the belief that a beggar was hired by a rich man to steal children whose blood he would give to his ill child in an effort to cure him of whatever his illness was. Dark. Have you heard of that legend before? No. I have heard of this before. I cannot remember what case it was tied to, but I have heard of this before. I mean, I feel like there's lots of versions of things like this in like different cultures because it's basically like like the rich forced man. blood transfusion. Yes. Yeah. That's what this because, is. Because because they have money and they want yep. to save their kid. Yep. This nickname has been attributed to four real life Spanish killers. Manuel Blanco Roma Santa, who I plan to cover in another episode because he was pretty effed up. Juan Diaz de Guerrero, who we're talking about now, Francisco uh-huh. Leon, and Julio Tanto Hernandez. Fun fact. Juan had heard his past murders being attributed to El Sacamantacas, and in order to perpetuate that narrative, he says that is why he disemboweled Manuela, to throw suspicion off himself, and to hide the real reason behind the murders, which was his sadistic sexual urges. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. That has to be it, of course. Yep. All right, so back to our story. Mm-hmm. Surprisingly, Juan returned to Vitoria on September 21st, 1879, and was so promptly arrested and taken to the local jail, where he was recognized by Pio, who had come to arrest him before at his home. Once incarcerated, Judge Parada came to interrogate him, but Juan denied all the charges against him. Of course he did. After 12 days in jail, he was again interrogated by the warden, Mm -hmm. Jose Fresco, and Juan Jimenez, who was the key holder. And it was at that time that he confessed to the crimes he had committed, stating that they appealed to his religious beliefs. What? He was convinced that the only way he could attain divine mercy was by killing these women. Oh, that's some bullshit. Okay. He began his testimony by describing the murder of Maria, the maid that he stabbed in the heart and belly, Mm -hmm. before describing how he killed Manuela. Juan repeated this testimony before Judge Parada and his notaries on October 3rd, 1879, from Mm -hmm. 9 p.m. to 3 a.m., and added more details. Are you serious? Yeah. He spent six hours talking about this. Well, I bet he loved the attention. I'm sure he, he did. Finally, he, he was finally able to tell his story. Oh, I'm sure. And he knew that he wasn't going to get out anytime soon. Yeah, he had a captive audience. Why not? Mm-hmm. On October 4th, he confessed to the four previous murders he committed, not to mention the four failed attempts he committed as well. On November 11th, Judge Parada sentenced Juan to two death penalties and required him to give economic compensation to the families of Maria and Manuela. Juan was very composed when he asked his lawyers, Manuel Leite and Juan Echavarria, to sign the two death sentences in his name since he was illiterate and unable to write. Yeah. So he was like, can you sign my name for me because I can't do it myself. I'd be like, no. (laughs) Do it yourself. I don't want to pretend to be you. You piece of shit. After the sentences were signed, Juan was required to wear ankle shackles and not allowed the use of a shaving razor for a yeah, reason. We all we all know what he does with those. Yeah. It's said that he was able to shave his beard once with a lit match, but after this, he simply grew out his beard. What? I don't know how that works. I mean, I know I've seen it happen, but like the fact that it was possible in prison is unsettling to me. Yeah. One slightly positive thing is that Juan did learn how to read while incarcerated, but you know, he still fucking sucks. And is a terrible person. Yeah. He also received visits from his ailing wife, Juana, who would bring him washed clothes, 
which was very nice of her. I guess. One of his daughters also came to visit him and stated that it was his wife's fault that he was in the position he was because they sold everything of value in his home to purchase liquor. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. that's... Yep. It's got to be the reason. Yep. Yep, checks out. Yep. Juan's lawyers attempted to appeal his conviction to the Audencia de Burgas. So basically, think of the Spanish Supreme Court, mm -hmm. stating that he committed the crimes as an act of insanity. Oh, wow. We've never heard that before. Right. As a result of this, the court of Vitoria had Juan's mental state evaluated by a team of doctors, and they also interviewed all his family and friends. Juan was observed by a panel of 11 doctors who were testing him based on degeneration theory. Mm -hmm. Degeneration theory was developed in the second half of the 19th century by French alienists. According to this, cranial and facial features were said to aid in their diagnosis on whether or not the person in question had any sort of mental disorder. Mm -hmm. This study is also known by the more common name of phrenology. Yep. One of the first Spanish alienists, José María Escardo, was called to testify in Juan's appeal. Ramón Apraiz was amongst these physicians and wrote a first-hand account of the examination that was conducted on Juan in 1881. Escardo inspected the shape of Juan's head and his appearance and noted the following, quote, Under his sparse beard and dark, slightly jaundiced skin, his facial structure juts forward like a doggo's due to his prognathic lower jaw. His face takes on the short, wide, triangular appearance of a reptile's. The tawny eyes of the Malay race and a tiger's tense but certain tendency to spring. His physiognomy grants him a sinister appearance with a fierce, intense gaze. All of these features are a reflection of his tormented soul. There can be no doubt that he was epileptic. What? Yeah, <laughs> that's what I thought. Continuing. Goreo, from a somatic point of view, presents an ill-made, deformed head. But such a deformity! Broad at the base, tapering at the crown, with a narrow forehead and ample occiput. Occiput. I don't know what the hell that is. The posterior yeah. curvature is so depressed that the apex of the head and the nape of the neck are on the same plane. The transversal diameter is greater than the anterior-posterior diameter, and as for the two halves of the skull, the right is much larger than the left. End quote. Hmm. They really called him out <laughs> how yeah, ugly no he was. Jesus. <laughs> how ugly is he? <laughs> well, he's got part he's... dog, part reptile. He's also right. got like a weird monkey face. Yeah. Escardo went on to state that he felt Juan's personality was a result of his parents' derangement, as both of them were alcoholics, and claimed that all of his siblings, children, and nephews suffered from insanity. Because that's a thing, apparently. Fun. Based on these findings, he felt that Juan had congenital monomania, or basically had moral insanity that he suffered from abnormal emotions and behaviors even though there were no signs of mental deficiency, hallucinations, or delusions that would typically characterize someone as insane. Yeah. He was just an asshole. Mm-hmm. An asshole that became a monster. Yep. Ramon, who wrote the first-hand account of this examination, felt that Escardo's examination and diagnosis were totally off the mark. Yep. He gave his opinion on behalf of the local medical experts that took part in Juan's examination in a report that was provided on March 3rd, 1880, and it stated as follows, quote, On this basis, we deduce that Juan Diaz de Guerrero is not an imbecile and does not display any type of monomania at this time, nor did he when he committed those crimes now familiar to you all. Mm -hmm. If it were in our power to decide, we would strongly recommend commuting the last sentence, but never permit him to enter an asylum, end quote. Yeah, because he's a criminal. He's not crazy. Yeah. He is to be treated like the criminal monster he is. Yep. Juan's lawyers demanded a second report. Of course they did. And they had directors of the mental hospitals in Carabanca Alto and Toledo examine Juan. <laughs> Toledo. I know, right? <laughs> On May 24th, 1880, they determined that Juan was an imbecile 
and recommended that the crimes be classified as under the influence of partial madness. No. The Supreme Court, however, was like, nope, threw yeah. out the appeal and maintained yep. one sentence of two death penalties. Yep. Because screw you, guy. Mm -hmm. It's funny that you say that. Because on May 11th, 1881, Juan Diaz de Guerrero was garroted at the Polvorin Viejo prison of Vitoria at oh, 8.30 a.m. Dang. Yeah. His Ooh. executioner was Lorenzo Huertes. And if you don't know what garroting is, it's when you kill someone via strangulation with an iron collar or a length of cord or wire. In this case, Juan was placed on a seat. Think like a bench in a gym that you'd sit on to do like the shoulder press. Okay. And an iron collar was placed around his neck. Then the executioner would slowly tighten the collar using a metal rod. Uh-huh. Like winding it. Yep. Until Juan was strangled to death. Good. Juan was 60 at the time of his execution. Following his execution, Juan's body was put on public display for 10 hours before it was buried in an unmarked grave at the Santa Isabel Cemetery. However, his head was supposedly removed during his autopsy and sold to a medical collection in Madrid. That makes sense because they were freaking out about how stupid he was. <laughs> yeah, like his head, yeah. He was the perfect phrenology case, apparently. Yep. If this is true, his head has been lost. So take that as you will. No one knows where it is. Good. He doesn't deserve his head. <laughs> this is true. I just think it's funny that he lost his head when they thought he was insane. <laughs> and they literally lost it. Anyway, Juan's fourth wife, Juana, died on December 6th, 1881. But it's unclear what she died from. She was 56 mm -hmm. at the time of her death. I suppose that would be kind of a common age mm -hmm. during that time. The book that I mentioned above, El Sacamentacas, was written after Ricardo had visited Juan in prison and after he had spoken with him prior to his execution. It has been noted to be highly embellished in parts, but for the most part tells a linear version of events as they unfolded. Yeah. I mean, of course there's going to be embellishments because one, Juan himself would embellish. Mm -hmm. And two, it was such a shocking, scandalous thing and a terrifying thing that you would want to sensationalize it if it if it were to happen now there would have been how many tv shows and podcasts and movies about yeah, it yeah no shit you know yeah like there was a spate of copycat killings that took place between the periods that juan was inactive so between the years of 1874 to 1878 i can give you a short breakdown of them they aren't great and none of them were tied to juan as they didn't fit his mo did they find anybody well for it Are they at least one, the person who committed the crime was apprehended and punished accordingly. Okay. That sucks. The first occurred on January 2nd, 1878, when a 55-year-old woman was killed on her way home. The crime was particularly heinous and even worse than what Juan did to his final victim. So I'm going to spare you the details. No one was caught. Well, well and um, it was done in the wintertime. Yep. And he, didn't, and he didn't attack in the winter. No. On February 28th, no year given. A 75-year-old man abducted an 11-year-old girl from her home and did stuff. Done unspeakable things. Yep. For stabbing her several times in the stomach. He abandoned her, believing she would die, but she miraculously lived long enough to identify him three times before she passed on March 3rd. That's awful. He was found guilty, and his original charge of 20 years in prison was overturned by the Spanish Supreme Court, and he was put to death via Garrett on May 19th, 1880. There you go. The last crime that was committed, I couldn't find a date, but it was the murder of a woman in the countryside outside of Vitoria, and the suspect was believed to be a shepherd, but no arrests were ever made. Hmm. And that's the super fun story of... Uh, let me do his full name again. Let me scroll <laughs> to the top so I can say it. Juan Diaz de Garreo Ruiz de Aragondona. A piece of shit. He's a total piece of shit. <laughs> the biggest shit. Just gross. I can't remember who recommended this to me. I think it was Emily. So if it was you, Emily, god damn it. But <laughs> yeah, this one was told to me. 
they wanted me to, someone wanted me to cover this and I didn't write down who it was, but I'm pretty sure it was Emily. Whoever it is. No, thank you. <laughs> thanks, How but no you. thanks. How dare you? But I figured we haven't covered any. He's, he's one of the first Spanish serial killers. He is not the first one, but he is. Well, he's the first like infamous recorded one. No, because one of the other guys that I mentioned before that had the same nickname as him mm-hmm. is the first. He's the first okay. one that mimics Jack the Ripper type atrocities to the mm-hmm. body before yeah. Jack the Ripper became a thing. Gross. So, super fun. Anyway, yeah. on that note. A murder so incompetent, it took nine people to successfully commit it. And yet, they would have gotten off scot-free if not for one mayor who took a first stab at crime scene investigation. A young woman whose heinous crime would have gone utterly unpunished if not for a chemist. And a clever kitchen maid. How forensics was used during the Salem Witch Trials. Check out these cases and more with me, Christy Baxter, as we explore the history of forensic science on Detectives by the Decade. From pseudoscience to junk science to, well, actual science, from toxicology to trace evidence, from the evolution of the detective to DNA, eventually. And so, so much more. We look at the cases, the scientists, the detectives, and the criminals to find out how forensic science came to be. New episodes every Thursday, available wherever you listen to podcasts. This week's podcast plug is the Detectives by the Decade podcast. Detectives by the Decade explores the detectives, cases, and crimes that made forensic science and investigation what they are today. Nice. Run by our friend Christy, who's one of the hosts of the Old Timey Crimey podcast. It offers fun deep dives into a variety of cases that change the way we look at crime and prosecute criminals. So if you like learning more about how crimes were investigated and how people were punished, not just the crimes themselves... Yeah. I encourage you to give them a listen. That's really cool. And we'll have a link to it in the show notes. I noticed when I was looking through their back catalog that they have a whole series on Pinkerton, the Pinkerton Uh, Detective Agency. So Mm -hmm. I was like, I gotta listen to those. Yeah. And this week's listener question comes from Dustin of the Sandman Stories Presents podcast. Hi, Dustin. He wants to know, and we might not know the answer to this, honestly, what punishment was too harsh for the crime? Well, this last one wasn't. No. <laughs> it's the first time I've heard of that being used, honestly. Yeah. Uh, it must It must have been Spain's preference, though, depending on how harsh the crime was, because they did it for the other guy, too. Yeah. I wonder if that was just the punishment at the time. Would have been easy. Crank. If, if, if you see a picture of this thing, too, it's... Yeah, it's nasty. It's gross. It's really awful. A punishment that doesn't meet the crime... I mean, like, life sentences for drug charges that are drugs that are legal in most states. Yeah. I mean, like, if you deal with, if you deal meth, fuck you. But, like. (laughs) Especially if you do it to kids, fuck you. Yeah. I mean, in general, fuck you, but. Yeah. Doubly so if you sell it to kids. Terrible, terrible person. But getting a life sentence for, like, having a little bit of weed on you. Yeah. Having, like, a quarter's worth of weed. Yeah. I would say the punishment doesn't meet the crime. See, mine, mine's going much lighter because I was going to say all the punishments that were doled out to the animals that were prosecuted in the Middle yeah. Ages were <laughs> kind of harsh. They were like evictions. Like how? Well, like when they like would penalties ha- for the pigs. Yeah, you know, like when they hang the pigs from their necks or mm-hmm. by their ankles until all the blood fell to their head. Like that kind of stuff is awful. Yeah. And they were just doing what they do because they're animals. They don't know yeah. any better. Wild animals that were starved. Yeah. Yeah, I went modern for that. Yeah, you did. And I was did. just like, pigs. <laughs> Save the pigs. <laughs> Save the pigs. At least eat them. Yeah. You don't have to hang them to death. You just, just kill them how kill you normally them. do. Yeah. All right. On that fun note, what's something good you'd like to share? Because it's been real dark. 
<laughs> it's been super dark. Wow. I love how I just went like as dark as possible jumping out of Spooktober. Yeah. Yeah, we were like, hey, we're out of it. By the way, murder. <laughs> like really awful murder. Yep. And desecration of bodies. Something good. I've ha- We've had a lot of little good things. Well, one good thing is my partner is back from training in a different state, and I'm just really happy to have him home. It's been nice. Mm-hmm. So it's been less than 24 hours. And it's just been really nice to have him back. But I had a really crazy day Friday, and I have some potentially super exciting news. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Regarding Willie, but I don't want to say anything yet to spoil it. Mm hmm. I also don't know if I can say anything yet, Yep. but I will hint that if this kind of partnership thing that I have going happens, Willie's going to be like so much more famous than he is right now. Yep. (laughs) Like he doesn't even know. And we'll find a way to share it with you guys. Yeah. He doesn't even know how wonderful and like amazed people will be at his brilliance. Mm Mm-hmm. It's the chance of potentially sharing the story of the first time he saved my life when we were first matched. So it's a really powerful story that I always kind of tend to gloss over because you don't really like, I mean, as one does, you don't really like to think of the day you almost died, mm-hmm. <laughs> generally. <laughs> and what was what's kind of cute is there's, there's one little bit to the story that his uh, service dog company latched onto they call it the ice cream story because that's the food i ate to recover from this like horrific low so i thought that was really like a cute surprising thing they're like i hear you have like an ice cream story (laughs) it's like what (laughs) what's a really bright and sunny way to describe that when i think of that story the last thing i think of is the ice cream but you know i suppose that's a nice PR way for them to spin it. It is. It's a very like marketing friendly way to spin that. It's a very cute thing. Like she got freezer burned from eating ice cream so fast because she was dying. (laughs) Her body was shutting down. But we'll see. I'll keep you guys updated as much as I can. But if I can continue to share the story and get the word out there and get Candu Canine some well-earned and well-deserved money to make more teams, I am ready and willing to do so. So everybody deserves a Willy like mine. He's the best Willy ever. Mm-hmm. So what's your what's your good thing? Mm. Here, before you before you do it, what were the costumes of your children? Since I don't I don't have children, so I can't say that. What, what were the Halloween costumes? My youngest was a black cat. Cute. And she would. Yeah. It wasn't a traditional black cat costume. It was like a dress type costume from Target. I can share a picture on social. And my oldest dressed as one of the participants of the Squid Game, which is interesting considering she's never watched the show. But I would be mortified. <laughs> yeah, we got to go out today, the day of Halloween, to get her a costume because she didn't have one. Yep. Yep. That's that's the age. Yep. So I bought you. her a track suit. And by that, I mean, I bought her like a hoodie and sweatpants that matched. Mm-hmm. And then we made it a track suit by using masking tape to put yep. like the lines on the sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm not buying Adidas, just masking taped on the numbers and stuff. And yep. now she can I mean, take the tape off and wear it to school like she would anyway. So yeah, there you go. Repurposed okay, Halloween now, costume. Now you're a good thing. I don't have much, so I'm just going to say I'm done a pant size. <gasps> That's so exciting. Congratulations. Thanks. You've been doing it in a really like thoughtful, healthy way, too, you know? Yeah. My numbers aren't where I want them to be, but that's okay. But numbers don't matter, and you're doing really great. And going down a pant size is way more significant in the long run. Well, on that note, let's shut it down. So you can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at yieldcrimepod and on Instagram at yieldcrimepodcast. You can find us on YouTube. We're always looking for subscribers. So Subscribe. Subscribe. Hit hit whatever the button is. Blow up all the buttons. Yeah. Don't literally blow <laughs> up all the buttons, but like click the one that says subscribe. <laughs> we have a P.O. box. It's nothing new, but it's very lonely. You can send us stuff to yieldcrimepodcast 
P.O. Box 341, Wyoming, Minnesota, 55092. If you can't remember that, it's in the show notes. I got you, fam. Yeah. You should send in Cherry Cordial. Oh, God. Yeah. Why? Because they're awesome. What? Okay. Well, what would you have? What's your holiday snack? I don't know. Not Cherry Cordials. <laughs> now you have to send them to, to make God. them. God. <laughs> I'll take a video of myself, like, dry heaving as I take it out of the box. Jeez. <laughs> Rude. Anyway, you can email us, <laughs> send us your questions, comments, story suggestions to yield crime podcast why does she hate cherry cordials because it's fucking gross it's fucking nasty chocolate shouldn't explode cherry into your mouth that's gross it's perfect okay stop i'm gonna get sick (laughs) yield crime podcast at gmail.com send us things that are not cherry cordials a great way to support the show is to leave a five-star rating and review it doesn't take very long Mm -mm. you might think it's so stupid that we're asking for it But it means so much. You have no idea. Yeah, it really does. You can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, and Good Pods. I've got you again by including links in the show notes. So you can very easily just go click, click, click. So you can just like do emojis. Yeah. Speaking of emojis. Cherries. There's one in this one right here that I'm going to read you from Apple Podcasts. It's nice. from our friend Alex in Canadia. Nice. Hello, Alex. And she says, hilarious, informative, and amazing. Lindsay and Madison have such a great sisterly chemistry, which makes the show so easy to listen to. They're hilarious, but also great at providing their in-depth research. I appreciate how they cite their sources and are willing to acknowledge any mispronunciations. This show is binge-worthy <laughs> and one that has a bright future ahead of it. Heart Aww. emoji from Alex of the Weird Distractions podcast, which is thank also you. a fabulous podcast. I love you, Alex. Yeah, thank you. Speaking, speaking of corrections, we're going to have a couple. <laughs> I know. If you're like, I love you guys, I want to take it a step further. First of all, yeah. thank you. Second of all, hold up there. Right. We are both involved. <laughs> but that doesn't mean you can't buy us a coffee. Leave us a one-time mm-hmm. donation. We like coffee and it helps I us. If we're not using it to actually caffeinate ourselves, it goes towards paying for running logistically the show. Yep. It's a great way to help us out. Another great exactly. way where you get something back is to join our Patreon. You can join it for as little as a dollar a month. So that's 12 bucks a year and you get early ad-free access to all of our episodes. Yep. That includes bonus content that we get Mm -hmm. from other shows that we've guested on, which you'll get to hear straight on the Patreon app without having to run around the internet to find it on their channel. Yeah, who likes to run around the internet? I don't. There's so many tubes. (laughs) So many tubes. And if you're like, I need more, head on over to our Public shop, pick up some merch. We've got some fun designs. I know I never came through with the Paris green design for Halloween because oh, I am yeah. so busy and I suck at life. But no, because the green was kind of Christmassy, I'm going to do say. it for December. So stay tuned for some deadly December merch. Yeah, I said it. I'm saying it now. Deadly December. TM, TM, TM. I, yeah, like you could have a lady with like a skeletal hand putting tinsel, <laughs> green tinsel, on like a Christmas tree. Chestnuts burning down the house on the tree. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's on fire. Wallpaper fumes melting <laughs> your insides. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it's fashion. Happy holidays. And on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime.